Good evening. My name is Jane Fallion, the director and playwright of the show that you are about to see. Welcome to Riverwalk Theater. An Act of Madness was first performed as a high school forensics competition piece with the Michigan Interscholastic Forensic Association in 2002. At the end of our season, my hope was to share it with the community and especially with the people from Bath. However, as the school year came to an end, students were overwhelmed with commitments and we simply ran out of time. It was revived at the Renegade Theater Festival in 2009 with Bath Citizens as our talk back guests. We were then honored to perform several times in Bath. And tonight we are once again privileged to share this story with you. As a, a citizen of Bath said, so many books on Michigan and we aren't even in the index. The pandemic has changed all of our lives as we live a new normal. With that in mind, today's production is a reimagined version of the show. We've altered the script for this new reality and added sound effects and visuals. We rehearsed virtually on Zoom, are performing on Zoom, and have worked through the technical challenges of all of that. Thank you for your time and now an act of madness. This is the story of the Bath School Massacre, the deadliest act of mass murder in a school in United States history. It grabbed newspaper headlines worldwide, bumping the Lindbergh flight from the front pages. It still remains today the largest mass murder of school children, including the shooting rampages at Sandy Hook, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, Columbine, Virginia Tech, and the University of Texas at Austin. This tragic event is part of history, but tragically, it is also a story lost in history. May 18th, 1927. Emma McDonald was eight years old. Her friend Doris Johns was seven. George Hall was nine. Harold Woodman, nine. Catherine Foote was nine days shy of her 10th birthday. Lloyd Zimmerman was 12. George Zimmerman was 10. Iola Hart was 12. Her brother Percy was 11. Their sister Vivian was eight. Robert Cochran was just finishing the third grade. Earl Ewing was 11. Beatrice Gibbs was nine years old. Ralph Cushman was seven. The day he died. The day she was killed. The, the day, day they were, were murdered. murdered. An act of madness. Based on newspaper accounts. Historical records. The Bath School Disaster by M.J. Ellsworth. May Day by Grant Parker. The Bath Museum Exhibit. This piece is dedicated to the children of Bath. The list of the dead would include 45 names. 38 of them. Children under the age of 15. The newspapers called it America's largest single event mass murder. And it was. And would hold that distinction. That title. For more than 90 years. It happened not so very far from here. No, no more, more than, than 10, 10 miles. miles. In, in the, the tiny, tiny town, town of Bath, Bath Michigan, Michigan. In, in 1927. 1927. In the spring of 1927, Bath, Michigan was a village really. A small farming community of 300. Just a stone's throw from the Lansing State Capitol building. The agricultural center for all the farms in the township. Bath was a small but bustling township with a blacksmith shop. The Michigan Central Railroad Depot. The, the People's, People's Bank. Bank. The Delamar, the Delamar Hotel. Hotel. Two community halls. A general store. A barber shop and a little meat market. Cushman and Sons Grain Elevator. And right there on Main Street. The, the Consolidated, Consolidated School. school. Leaving behind the tradition of one-room schoolhouses scattered throughout the rural area. After years of heated debate, the district voted to build a new central school. A central school to serve the entire township. Grades, Grades 1, one through, 12. through 12. Enrollment of 236 children and adults. Only institution of its kind in Clinton County. The two-story Bath, Bath Consolidated, Consolidated School. School. May 18, 1927. It was a Wednesday. The only unusual thing about the start of the school day should have been the excitement in the air. Summer vacation was two, two days, days away. away. It began as a cloudless, peaceful, peaceful. Beautiful. beautiful, perfect spring day. 
In a classroom on the second floor of the North Wing, Mrs. Hart was reading a story to her sixth graders. Dean Sweet was taking the seventh grade geography exam. School Superintendent Emery Hike was watching over study hall. Second floor, East Wing. Earlier in the morning, he and his wife had said goodbye to each other. Exactly as they had a hundred times before. Make it a good day. Go well. Go well. By 8.30 that morning, the faculty and more than 200 children were hard at work in the school building. What they didn't know, what they could not imagine, was that just beneath them, throughout the crawl spaces, under the floorboards, were, were bundles, bundles of dynamite. dynamite. That morning, around 8.45, we heard, we a, heard sound, a sound, like a, like a blast. blast, off in the distance. The noise had come from just west of town, well, from the Kehoe farm. If you ask around, Andrew Kehoe was always a strange sort. Quick to help people. Quick to criticize. Quick to lose his temper if he didn't get his way. Cruel. Killing, Killing his, his neighbor's, neighbor's dog. dog. Beating his horse to death. Always neat and spotless. Too neat. Meticulous. Cold. Something was not right about him. And very smart. Knew all about modern electricity, using dynamite, how to fix farm machinery. His reputation for careful thriftiness helped him get elected to the Bath School Board. He had fought hard against the new school. Fought, fought hard. hard. The sharp increase in property taxes were enormous. Kilo said that the cost in higher taxes was unfair. That it was illegal. And it would be the, the ruin, ruin of, of him. Me. His rage against school taxes was matched by the rage against his wife's family. His wife, Nellie, a popular teenager. From one of the most respected families in Michigan. Her uncle, Lawrence, was a war hero, auto pioneer, politician, and significant philanthropist. Upon his death, he willed $100,000 to build a hospital in Lansing. St. Lawrence Hospital. But Nellie, constantly, constantly sick. sick, with severe frontal headaches, and incessant coughing attacks, had been in and out of the hospital for months at a time accumulating a stack of overdue medical bills. Constantly, Constantly growing. growing. Time after time. After time after time. After time after time. Felt the rest of the school board siding against him and going along with his greatest opponent. Superintendent, Superintendent Hike. Hike. Unfair. And there was the humiliation of being served with mortgage foreclosure. So, so many, many injustices. injustices. Real, Real or imagined. Or over the years, Kehoe had been very vocal about how he blamed the Bath School Board for his troubles. His next door neighbor said, when he lost the vote to be elected justice of the peace, by such a wide margin, it was as if the town had turned against him. Unfair. Later at the inquest, witnesses wondered if that was when he started planning his revenge. Against Hike. Against the school. Against the town. For the last six months at least, he had been buying dynamite at different stores in Lansing. Small amounts each time, so as not to arouse suspicion. As a board member appointing to perform, appointed to perform maintenance duties, Kehoe always had free access to the school building. And bit by bit, day after day, Kehoe began carrying bundles of explosives into the school's basement. Placing each package so that everything was concealed in the crawl spaces behind the beams. Stretching hundreds of feet of wire around pipes, over rafters. Connecting the wires to an intricate series of charges and explosives. Little by little, piece by piece, night after night, until over 1,000 1, pounds of dynamite lay ready beneath the floors of the bath school. In every corner, crevice, and unused space. That Wednesday morning, back at his own farm. First noise we heard was the house going up. Kiho began igniting a series of firebombs. Like that the whole house was in flames. Ex explosions were rigged up everywhere. To the house. To the sheds. To the tractors. He even wired the horse's ankles together so they couldn't run when the fire started. Kiho was determined to leave behind nothing. nothing. And out back on the hog cart, Kiho left the body of his wife, Nellie, charred and burned. Already dead. And the sign. Wired to the fence. A sign, sign that, that read, read criminals, criminals are, made, are made, not, not born. born. Seeing the smoke, Sidney Howell and some other neighbors 
rush to the Kehoe place to fight the fire. As we ran up the driveway, we saw Kehoe behind the wheel of his pickup truck. He says to us, Boys, you're my friends. You better get out of here. You better get down to the schoolhouse. Then he speeds away. It was 9.45 a.m. Much larger than the first. They could hear it at least 10, Ten miles, miles away. away. Miss Gullikhurst and Miss Weatherby's students begged for just one more story. Don Ewing, Arthur Woodman, William Robb, and Charlie Havlin, Havlin were tossing a softball. One last catch before school started. Mr. Huggett was next door at the Methodist Church. He and Mr. Hayek were rehearsing senior girls for graduation ceremony. Miss Matson busied herself in the library preparing the English and Latin exams. Young Harry Bernard approached Crumb's pharmacy with fishing in mind. Pole and fishing tackle in hand. The town was waking up. Jay Pope Sr. decided to stop by the barbers for an early shave. Charlie Havlin had just lofted a high arching fly ball. Art Woodman adjusted his position. And then it happened. Miss Sterling, a teacher on the second floor said, without warning, this terrible blast came. The floor, floor heaved up, up several Tremendous feet. force, it, it, it tore apart giant chunks of foundation. I saw the bodies of my children hurled against walls. And through windows. Eight-year-old Cleo Clayton leapt through a window and ran to the front lawn. Safe for now. Anson McNatt turned towards the sound of the explosion. He looked through the French doors leading to the classrooms on the north wing. And saw... Nothing, nothing there. there. That whole wing of the building. The third grade. The fourth grade. The fifth grade. That was all gone. The walls were destroyed. The roof lay on the floor. I don't remember hearing any noise, but, but I do remember flying in the air and seeing things fly between me and the sun. From across Main Street, it looked as if a part of the school seemed to lift up. The so windows shattered. shattered. The walls caved outward. The upper floors were the collapsed. The, the roof, roof crashed, crashed down. down. Silence. Silence. Then we heard the screams. The sound of the blast drew everyone to the center of the town. Windows were shattered. Door hardware wrenched from wood. The church itself heaved and pews were uprooted. The schoolyard filled up with neighbors and parents frantically trying to dig through to reach those trapped underneath. I thought I fell asleep. There were piles of things on top of me. I couldn't move. There was a little boy pinned against me. His eyes were looking right at me, but I knew he was dead. I knew I was bleeding. I, I screamed and men began digging for me. Uh, they were buried in the dark, calling out to us. We could see children's bodies, or parts of bodies. People were yelling to get them rope and get shovels. People were yelling for their kids. That's when we saw Andrew Kehoe drive in front of the school. Unknown to all was that the back of his car was loaded with more dynamite and pieces of metal scraps. Nails. Nuts. Bolts. Tools. Machinery bits. Superintendent Hike ran to make sure that the calls for help had been made and was back in the schoolyard helping to organize rescue efforts. Kehoe spotted the superintendent and called him over. Hike reached the truck and asked Kehoe for help. Kehoe replied, All right, I'll take you with me. And with those words, he turned with a shotgun in hand and fired a blast into the cab, hitting a bundle of dynamite. A flaming column of fire erupted sideways down the street. The blast hurled, tossed, hinged, and crushed children. Whirling shrapnel struck children with stabbing pain. Standing nearby, O.H. Buck said, a, a, a great cloud of smoke was rolling up, and, and under it I saw the remains of a car. Part of a human body was caught in the steering wheel. Other bodies were lying on the ground nearby. I began to feel body parts hung from trees, buildings, cars, flesh dangled from overhead wires. Moans and screams could be heard under the debris. It began to feel as though the world, the world was, was coming, coming to, to an, an end. end. With his last act, Andrew Kehoe had killed himself and his enemy and the postmaster Gladden Smith and Mr. Smith's father and eight-year-old Cleo Clayton. Mrs. Carpenter said, To say the scene was pitiful could not describe that first hour after the blast. 
a vision, a vision of, of hell, hell on, on earth. earth. Over a hundred people were injured and more were being uncovered each minute. And slowly the bodies of the victims were pulled out of the rubble as well. The dead were placed in neat rows on the grass one by one. Mr. Ellsworth said, There were sights that I hope no one will ever have to look at again. Henry Bergen. This is John spotted what looked like a crumpled doll. Herman Bergen, 11, hanging from a twisted beam. Seven-year-old Ralph Cushman. It took her a moment to realize it was her third grader, Doris. Floyd Burnett. George Hall took a break from all the digging. Robert Bromond, 12. Among the dead, he found his own son. Billy Hall. Well, there's Billy. And he went back to digging. Willa Hall. Mrs. Eugene Hart sat in the street with her two dead girls, one in each arm, and the body of her son Percy lying in her lap. Iola Hart, 13. Vivian Hart, 10. Percy Hart, 11. Broken bones, bodies ripped apart. Russell Chapman, 9. Bolts protruding from bodies. Amelia Bromond. Sights I hope no one will ever look at again. Emergency calls had gone out to Lansing, East Lansing, Ovid, and St. John's. Volunteer help arrived. Consumers' power workers, already there hanging wires, heard the explosion. Dr. and Mrs. Crum turned their pharmacy and ice cream parlor into a field hospital. Mrs. Shaw's house became a Red Cross station. Fathers and mothers kept digging through the wreckage. Even after bushels of unexploded dynamite were uncovered in the ruins, the Lansing unit of Fisher Body closed down the whole plant and sent all their workers to help. Governor Fred Green arrived, took off his coat, and helped shift the fallen walls. He told his staff to get moving, making coffee and sandwiches. Farmers, Michigan Bell, Barker Fowler Electric Company, the 119th Field Artillery set up a field kitchen. And young nurses, firemen, and MSU ROTC members and college students. People we didn't even know, whose names never made the papers. People who answered a call for help. The reporters' stories were news around the world. Maniac blows up school! 45 killed, 38 of them children. Agonizing scene in schoolyard. Distraught parents find little ones dead beneath blankets. Dynamite outrage at a school. 41 killed when fiend blows up school. And the town of Bath was mourning. There should be a new word for grief. Everyone in town had lost a neighbor. A teacher. A child. First, though, the, injures had, the injured had to be attended to. And then funerals. They were done in shifts. Seventeen pastors came to Bath to hold funerals. Friday the 20th saw the first of so many, many funerals. Eleven. Eighteen funerals were held Saturday. Eleven on Sunday. Townspeople spent whole days going to funerals and not able to pay respects at all of them. Go well. Go well. Go well. The town of Bath, Michigan was famous now, and every church service, every town meeting, every burial news. And the first Sunday after the disaster. The same day Charles Lindbergh completed his historic flight. The most extraordinary thing happened. 400,000 visitors came to Bath. 75,000 to 100,000 autos passed through. A double line of traffic was 15 miles long and growing. There were gawkers, of course. And souvenir hunters, yes. Cars headed off to sightsee. Some stopped right in the road. Some peered in windows. Others headed to homes with memorial flowers outside. Still others stopped to picnic on adjacent lawns. But not as many as you might think. Strangers showed up offering support. Crumpled dollar bills or just their prayers. 400,000. That's more than showed up to watch Lindbergh land in Paris. It was just the entire state of Michigan had decided to show their respects and go to Sunday services there. After a time, the spotlights shifted away. Notoriety fades. People move on. The newspapers kept trying to find a reason behind the disaster. There was no acceptable explanation. There never is. There are those who say, Kehoe achieved his objective. He wiped the town off the map. And that may be true. 
so many books on Michigan history, and we aren't even in the index. But the survivors did carry on. Dean Sweet said, well, with time you heal, but I don't think you ever get well. You learn to live with it, I guess. Life goes on. And the citizens of Bath decided, decided to, to rebuild. rebuild. The Bath Relief Fund was established. School resumed in the fall in two community halls. According to Gene Wilkins, the Bath town historian, our quest to build a new school was the thing that pulled the community through. Donations came in from all over the world. A statue was commissioned. A copper statue of a little girl to commemorate the children who had died. It was paid for by penny donations sent in from school children all across Michigan. It was rumored that those pennies had been melted down to form the statue itself. The place where the school stood is now a park. The old cupola was placed at the center of the park. There's a plaque that reads, This memorial is dedicated to those that lost their lives as a result of the... Bath School Disaster on May 18th, 1927. Our town of Bath will always remember you. We'll always remember you. Always remember. Always. Always. Go, Go well. well.